Hello everyone. In this video, we are going to discuss about the peptides and the peptide bond. When two amino acids join, a peptide bond forms. It's very easy to remember. You can also view this reaction as simple elimination of a water molecule between the carboxyl group of one amino acid and the amino group of the other. As you see here, this reaction still leaves an amino group available on one end of the dipeptide and unreacted carboxyl group on the other end. And hence, the reaction could in principle be continued by adding amino acids at both ends. Let's see the example of addition of two amino acids, glutamic acid and lysine to this chain. Why I chose these amino acids? Because glutamic acid is amino acid with acidic R group and lysine is amino acid with basic R group and this will make easy for me to explain you the acid base properties of a peptide. So let's examine this tetrapeptide. As you see here, glutamic acid and lysine are added to the chain and now we know that a molecule of water must be eliminated. The portion of each amino acid remaining in the chain is called an amino acid residue. Here you see the alanyl and glycyl residue in the tetrapeptide. Since the alanyl chain contains only a few amino acid residues, like tetrapeptide, they are collectively referred to as oligopeptides. If the chain is very long, it is called a polypeptide. Most oligopeptides and polypeptides still retain unreacted amino group at one end which is uh, called as the amino terminus or N terminus and an unreacted carboxyl at the other end which is called as the carboxyl terminus or C terminus. However, there are some exceptions where certain small cyclic oligopeptides in which the N and C termini have been linked. For example, in this case, N termini are blocked by N formyl or an acetyl group as you see here. In some cases, the C terminal carboxyls have been modified to amides. So now we know that if the amino acid chain is very long, it is called a polypeptide. What we can say from this is all proteins are polypeptides since there are many amino acids which are joined by peptide bonds to make a full chain of protein. This is why understanding the nature of polypeptides and the peptide bond is a very important part of biochemistry. As we know, in addition to the free amino group at the N terminus and the free carboxyl group at the C terminus, polypeptides usually contain some amino acids that have ionizable groups on their side chains. These various groups have wide of pK values as we understood in my previous video. So if you titrate the polypeptide, we can imagine starting with the tetrapeptide in a very acidic solution, say pH 0. At this pH, which is below the pK of any of the groups present, all of the ionizable residues in their protonated form. All amino acids will be positively charged and each carboxyl will have zero charge as you can see here. Therefore, whole molecule will have a charge of plus two at this pH. If we now imagine removing protons from the solution by titrating with NaOH for example, the various group will lose protons at pH values in the vicinity of their pK value. As protons are removed raising the pH, more groups will become deprotonated. The positive charge will decrease and it will pass through zero and the molecule will become negatively charged, ultimately reaching a net charge of minus two at very high pH, as you can see here. As I mentioned before in my previous video, acid-based properties of amino acids, isoelectric point, which is um, one pH at which the net charge on an ampholyte is zero. Every amino acid, peptide and protein has an isoelectric point. Which pH it lies depends on the relative numbers and kinds of acidic and basic groups in the molecule. 
Keep in mind that the molecule still possesses some charge groups at the isoelectric point. It is only the net charge that is zero. This effects of changing pH is very important in biochemistry and protein chemistry. Sometimes even a small shift in pH will significantly modify behavior of a protein molecule. At the isoelectric points, solubility of many proteins is minimal since the molecules no longer repel one another when their net charge is zero. The fact that different proteins and oligopeptides have different net charges at a given pH is often used as an advantage in that separation either by electrophoresis or by ion exchange chemistry which we will be discussing soon in my next videos. Now let's examine the structure of peptide bond. In the dipeptide formed by glycine and alanine, as you see here, the shaded portion contains what is called the peptide bond. As I mentioned before, peptide bond could be formed by the elimination of a water molecule between two amino acids. In fact, in an aqueous solution, this is not a favored process. See this reaction. I am not going much into the detail, but in short, the free energy change for this reaction at room temperature in aqueous solution is about plus 10 kJ per mole. Therefore, the thermodynamically favored reaction under this condition is the hydrolysis of the peptide bond with equilibrium lying well to the right side. You can see here the formation of uh, zwitter ions which is more stable form of amino acids in aqueous solution as I discussed in my previous video. Polypeptides are easily hydrolyzing when catalysts are present. There are several ways peptide hydrolysis can be catalyzed. A general method is heating the peptide in strong mineral acid, usually 6 molar hydrochloric acid which cleaves all peptide bonds. Cyanogen bromide, which cleaves to the carboxyl side of methionine residues, the number of fragments produced from a polypeptide by cyanogen bromide can be predicted from the number of methionine residues in the chain. More specific catalysis is provided by proteolytic enzymes or proteases. Let's see the role of proteolytic enzymes in detail. Some of these enzymes are secreted into the digestive tracts of animals where they break down proteins for further digestion. As you can see here, few enzymes are listed in the table. I have included only few but there are many. We will emphasize more on trypsin for our proteomic applications. There are other enzymes such as pepin found in certain plant tissues. These enzymes have a specific cleavage site preferences. For example, trypsin cleaves at the carboxyl side of the lysine and arginine. And you can see the preference site for the other enzymes as uh, listed in the table. The existence of battery of such enzymes with specific cutting sites is of great utility to the biochemist because they allow the cleavage of polypeptides in well-defined ways. The part of the strategy of amino acid sequence analysis is to fragment the polypeptide chain in at least two different ways so that the small peptide fragments resulting from one procedure overlap with those resulting from the other. For example, trypsin is used for the first cleavage and the second cleavage may be carried out with uh, some other proteases such as chymotrypsin, pepsin or by the cyanogen bromide reaction. Sometimes a third or fourth partial hydrolysis is required to give the necessary overlapping peptides. I hope this video helped you to understand peptides, structure of peptide bond and peptide hydrolysis. If you have any question or suggestion, feel free to leave a comment and stay tuned for my next video. I will be releasing more videos to understand the fundamentals of proteomics. Thank you for watching.